Raging Cajuns podcast. I am here, Jeff Schneider, with two very special guests. Tim Leger, he's the assistant coach for football, does wide receivers and recruiting coordinator. And then his son, Gunnar Leger, who is a senior on the Louisiana baseball team. How are we doing, guys? What's going on, Jeff? Good. How's it going? You know, we'll, we'll just jump right into it. This is a baseball family. Uh, from the beginnings to now, baseball's been in y'all's blood. Um, let's, let's start with you, Tim. Uh, drafted out of high school. Mm-hmm. What was that like for you? Um, it, it was a really good experience. You know, um, I think you learn over time and as you grow that that you're probably not ready for the experience at that age. You know, and I, I think as the numbers bear out now that, you know, 60 percent of big league rosters are four year college players. And there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. Um, just the maturity level and all the things that that it takes to 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 go through that process. Um, you know, you. In hindsight, if I had to do it over again, I'd probably, you know, take the path that Gunner took and, and be a four-year college player. But it was a great experience. Met great people. Still in contact with a lot of those guys uh, from from those times, and so it, it was it was fun. Now, how much of that knowledge was were you able to, you know, impart on Gunner? Not not just when you got to the college level, but you know, in his early days when he was growing up as a baseball player. Well, I think. Um, what you learn is when you get into coaching, you really start to understand, you know, the the things you wish you knew when you were playing. And then I just tried to, you know, just always talk to him about, you know, being on time, being accountable, playing hard, doing things the right way. And probably early on, um, you know, it was more more mechanical and all that stuff than I probably should have been with him. But you know, at some point when you realized, when I realized uh, how passionate he was about it, how serious he was about it, and he was going to figure it out. You know, um, then it was just about, you know, encouraging him and, you know, talking to him about the nature of the game itself, you know, good days, bad days, you know, whether you work or don't work, you know, if you work, you tend to have an opportunity to do and be a little more successful. If you don't work, you have no shot. And even if you do work, there's going to be days that it don't work out real well for you. So you just got to kind of ride the wave, you know. So, Gunner, did you grow up a Pirates fan because your dad was uh, drafted by the Pirates? Uh, I actually grew up a Yankees fan. Um the girl or woman now that used to babysit me was Ron Guidry's daughter. Um, so I have boxes full of just about every notable Yankee you can think of. I mean, Mr. Ron, um, Hideki Matsui, Randy Johnson, Roger Clemens, Derek Jeter, A. Rod. I mean, You're and that's half right? of them. Yeah, yeah. It's just, so, and you were okay with him being a Yankees fan? I love it, man. I was a Yankees guy growing up. It was really pretty cool because growing up, I was a Yankees guy. And I mean, Mr. Ron's poster was on my door. Mm-hmm. Most of my him and Will Clark, you know, he's kind of the here's the pitcher, here's the hitter, mm-hmm. um, and those two guys were guys that I was really into growing up. And then, you know, started coaching at STM, and and uh, Ron's daughter Danielle ran track for us. She was a cheerleader for us. She was a, a really good athlete herself, and um, just so worked out that you know she was she was uh, available and did some babysitting for us and kind of transported him around when we were younger, um, and then. You know, he, he and Mr. Ron kind of have become close, and they're still they're still cl- kind of close with Danielle and all that. She checks on him periodically, and and then once she goes to spring training, Mr. Ron always goes to spring training every year. It was like Christmas when they came back. You know, oh, we yeah. were getting we were getting just you know jerseys and balls and pictures yeah, and that probably one, the that the, one picture yeah. I have with. I think it's David Wells, Whitey Ford, Andy Pettit, Andy Pettit, and Ron Guidry. Yeah, they all signed, signed autograph. Kind of was. It's as like a, a personal picture. Like yeah. I mean, they, it looks like they took it just to on a cell phone and blew yeah. it up. Yeah, and then she got it framed, and they all signed it, and it's the Lanky, Yankee lefties, you know. And so that was on his nightstand for yeah. a long time. Um, cool. Still in the bedroom. Uh, I think it's in, we, it's, it's in storage yeah, right now. Yeah, we put them all up. Once we when we moved and he, he came here, we kind of slid all that stuff around. But once we'll. I'll have a room for it in my yeah, house one we'll day. Yeah, we'll get situated Man, one day. Get we'll get it, it all up. Yeah. So, you've, Gunner, you've had a pretty successful baseball career. You really got started, though, in 2008 uh, when you made the national scene with the Little League World Series mm-hmm. at Lake Charles. Um, just just take me through what that experience was like for you. Um, I mean, that was, that was awesome. That was um, – I mean, I had been playing with those guys for so long um, – the Little League World Series, I guess, in itself wasn't a great experience. I mean, it was. I mean, it was a great experience. I guess 
in-game stuff and what happened towards the end wasn't great, but that kind of, I guess, helped shape me or, or I guess, put in my head what I wanted to do for the rest of my life and almost like, almost kind of like the game challenged me. And I, at first I really didn't know what was going on, like he was talking about earlier, saying that, you know, you're going to have good days and bad days. I just assumed because I never really had – a stretch where I struggled or, I mean, I'd never been on a national stage. None of us had, um, and failed on that type of stage. Um, but you know, you give up the lead pitching and then go in and then make the air for them to win it. And I, mean, I can remember going back to middle school and <clears throat> I know you're young and kids are ruthless, but I mean, they're like, I'm in my locker and they're walking by telling me like, way to go. You blew the game, stuff like, like pretty bad stuff. I took um, it serious. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I took it serious. And I, I was, I struggled with it for a while, um, but I think at the end of the day, I think it it made me who I am, made me be able to handle some things that maybe some other people couldn't at a certain age. So, and as a parent going through all this, I mean, you you had been involved in baseball. What what was that like for you? Yeah, it, it was it was a neat experience to watch all those guys. You know, you're talking about. Uh, Bowen Bryce Jordan, who ended up playing at LSU. Trey Quinn was on that team. Kennan was a teammate. There were some notable names and guys that had gone on and, and, and you know, made a name for themselves as college and high school players. And um, and so to watch those guys grow, watch them all kind of go into it. And, and then they had a really good run, won the state championship, went to Waco and really kind of dominated that, that, that regional um, and had a great experience and then started off really, really good once we got to Williamsport. And then it just kind of fell apart a little bit at the end. But I think Gunner realized then, you know, the same things that, that kind of make him who he is now. Um, you know, he learned through that process. And, you know, you, you put in the same work in Waco and you're ultra successful and you get two wins, throw a no-hitter in Waco, right? Hit, mm -hmm. like, off the charts really mm -hmm. well in Waco uh, individually. And then gets to Williamsport and, you know, it's probably like one for 19 or something with a yeah, bunch of way. strikeouts and and then can't even get anybody out. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it was just, um, you know, just kind of validates, hey, you know, the work is the work and you really don't control the results at the end of the day. All you can do is um, prepare yourself to be successful. And some days you will be and some days you won't. The game kind of plays itself and has a mind of its own. You just got to get yourself ready to go the best you can. So I think he acknowledges that now and realizes that, you know, as he's gotten older, that the the failure on that stage, you know, basically, like he said, kind of created who he is, you know, kind of built him to what he's been able to do in his career. And, um, you know, people always say that to me. He looks like, like there's no emotion, nothing bothers him. He's always stone-faced. He's always, well, when you're 12 years old and you fail at the level that he did on that stage in front of, 36,000 people that mm -hmm. day and a couple million people on national TV, um, you know, you realize, you know, how, how cruel the game can be. And then just a matter of getting to work and trying to prepare yourself to be the best you can after that, you know? So baseball's big in the family, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say that football wasn't always big, also big. Yeah. Um, for both of you, what was it like growing up in a house where you had a football coach as a dad? And then obviously you played the sport as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I love playing. I I hated practicing. Um, <laughs> Wasn't I mean, that the way it always is? Yeah, I mean, I could, I could, you know, I could do baseball stuff all day. Hit, you know, if I if you if this was like softball and you could throw all day, I would just throw all day. Um, now, but football, I mean, Friday nights were obviously great, and I was still playing with. I mean, Kenan was our quarterback. Trey was the other wide receiver. I mean, we had it was all my buddies. It was the same gang basically that I grew up playing baseball with. Um, yeah, but practices were, no, nah, I, I could have never, I never really pursued it super hard. You know, I mean, I put the work in, went to our summer workouts and did the stuff I needed to do to be ready to play. But I mean, compared to like what Trey and some of those guys are doing, trying to prepare for college football and eventually professional football. I mean, I, I just, the running and the, yeah, I just couldn't do it. So, <laughs> well, he, he was always. I never tried to force any of it on him regardless. I mean, we did we did a little bit of everything. We bought him golf clubs, a guitar. I mm -hmm. mean, we literally kind of gave him the whole gamut and said, figure it out. And whatever you pursue, pursue it hard. And so we went through golf for a little while. He kind of did yeah. that. And he was pretty good at first. He's actually then, better at golf then than yeah, I am now. Yeah, I'm not very good The right older now. he got, the worse he got at golf. So we kind of put that up. And then... <laughs> 
Um, but the football thing, I would always give him the opportunity either way as I was just kind of said, hey, you want to throw today? Mm-hmm. What do you want to do? And he'd just say, he would always 100% of the time say, get your glove. <laughs> so there was never – The pick skin wasn't yeah, an option. Was never, it was never an option to, to – to throw football so we just play catch you know and we just kind of we kind of messed around with that stuff or we'd go hit or whatever it was but it was never hey grab the football I want to run some routes and you can whatever that never happened so but as a as a coach obviously in college you 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 don't get a whole lot of free time yeah Um, you know how difficult was that for you guys to have that bond even though you have a whole bunch of other sons on that football team that you're looking after yeah we I mean we were able to kind of keep it close, you know, and, and even when I was away, we talked once a week, you know, every other night, sometimes every day, just depending on what was going on. So we've always been close, I think. And, um, you know, it's it's hard as a parent because, you know, what happens is uh, with our schedule is he throws on Friday nights. All right, well, I can maneuver my schedule in recruiting or depending on practice times mm-hmm. or whatever to figure mm-hmm. out where, all right, where is he playing. I literally – you know, in the in the previous years before I got here, I mean, my spring recruiting calendar was literally set around. You know, I recruited Arkansas when they were in Jonesboro or Little Rock. Yeah. I recruited Monroe when they were. You know what I mean? And you so schedule it, around his I schedule. Was, I 100% scheduled the schools and players I wanted to see around where he was going to be, so I could see him throw on Friday nights. Um, now that he's pretending to be Demo, it's a little more difficult <laughs> to try to figure out when he's going to throw and where he's going to throw, but. Um, but you know it's it's just part of it, man. It's the, the way my job was, and 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 seeing him was important. Us being there was important. It's part of the reason why he chose this place is so his family and friends could see him. You know, so um, it's uh, just part of it. You know. Mm-hmm. And Gunner, for you, what was it like as a kid looking up to your dad, who was a pretty successful college coach? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I looked up to him more as, I guess just because I was so infatuated with baseball. I mean, he he taught me everything I knew or either that or put me in front of the people I needed to be in front of to get me to where I needed to be or I guess what he was trying to teach me. If he couldn't do it, he tried to find somebody that could do it. Um, so it was more, I mean, obviously he's been a successful coach and things he's been able to do as, as far as recruiting classes and different things at McNeese and ULM and, and here now um, speak for themselves. But I guess – I just looked at it. I mean, it wasn't I me. Mean, was my dad. He wasn't the wide receivers coach at McNeese. You know, um, mm-hmm. I appreciated more of the the life lessons and the baseball lessons that he was able to give me and be there. And in times of when, like he said, I mean, like the Little League World Series, when I had no idea why what had what happened was happening. You know, why it was me or just the different things like that. And I mean, there was plenty of times where. Maybe I didn't play as hard as I should have or done some things, and, I mean, he, he got after me. Um, mm-hmm. And then you're mad about it, but then, and just like I guess everybody will say, you realize once you get on the back end of it and you're older what he was saying or why he was saying what he was saying. Now, you, you, so as a football player at Barb, mm-hmm. you're a pretty good wide receiver, some runs in the state playoffs. Yeah. Um, you know, you – you said football wasn't really the th- the option you thought of going into college, but for both of you, um, what was it like for you to hang that side of the competition up? For me, it was – I really didn't have a choice. Um, going into my senior year, um, we found out about this bone cyst in my left femur, mm-hmm. um, trying to get opinions and do all kind of stuff, and no one – no doctor would really say, hey, you'd be, you'll be okay. You know, just go do it. You'll be fine. So we kind of just made a decision or, I, you know, I made a decision that yeah. it wasn't really in my best interest because I, I think I was either getting – I had had some offers and was getting recruited. I don't I can't remember if I was already committed here or not. But I, don't think, I don't think so. I don't yeah. think I was, uh, I was. But just that baseball was what I wanted to do and, and – I mean, I knew I was going to miss my senior year of football, especially with Kenan and Trey and all those guys and all my buddies. But I didn't want one catch on the sideline and a helmet to the femur to put me out for two years. And then I got a – I mean, I, I don't even know what a broken femur rehab looks like, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, they told me that if it got hit in the right spot with, with how the cysts 
was in my leg and, and how it had kind of thinned some of that bone out that it probably wouldn't be a, a great break. I mean, it would have shattered or something crazy would have. It wouldn't have been a good a good de- a good deal. So, um, I mean, it was tough for me. I was I think I mean I was at every game. Um, we weren't what we were my junior year. My senior year, we had lost. I mean, we had lost Deshaun Smith, Courtney Galantine, I mean, we had lost some guys that were all state um, all state players. Um, but I mean, it was it was cool to be around when Trey broke that record. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, just be around, be around my buddies and stuff. So it was good. Yeah, it was, it was the the thing about the going to see Dr. Marco and the the guys that we saw for his femur. Uh, Dr. Marco was, was was with the Lakers. He was with the the U.S. Olympic team, the ski team. Mm-hmm. He was a pretty renowned guy, um, and you know he basically had a really good feel for Gunner. Um, and what he wanted to do and try to do, and I don't. Gunner doesn't even realize this, but in the in the days that we were trying to make a decision, and Dr. Marco was really looking at these cysts and doing these things, um, his uh, PA took Gunner out of the room, and Dr. Marco said, "All right, Coach, is he a football player? Or is he a baseball player?" And I said, "Well, he's a he's a pretty good high school football player. I don't think he'll play in college because he doesn't want to." Uh, so, but I think he really has a future in baseball, mm-hmm. and I think he can do that if it's something that he wants to do. And he's like, Coach, in good conscience, I, I just can't clear this kid to play play football and, and have the contact risk. And I said, well, you know, you need to handle it how you need to handle it kind mm-hmm. of thing and put it in on his court. And basically he got Gunner out of the room to get a really good feel for what for we what thought. You thought. Yeah. And then he brought him back in and basically walked him right into the process of – basically deciding that mm-hmm. football wasn't going to be path. the future or the path. And it was in everybody's best interest, m- mainly his, to give it up. And so um, Dr. Marco was really remarkable through this whole process and really had a good feel, really uh, developed a relationship with Gunner and understood who he was to try to get to, to you know, get him right and get him where we are now and ultimately perform the surgery that he had last year um, and, and, you know, got him moving forward. So... He, he he's been amazing. He really has. Yeah, he's, he's pretty. pretty but it, it'd have been it'd have been easy for him to say, "Hey, the kid wants to play football. Let's let him play and run the risk." And mm-hmm. you know, you do that, and then you know, maybe it doesn't work out great. Maybe it does, or maybe he just is stone cold and says, "Hey, football's over." But he really tried to get a feel for who he was, what he wanted, and and what were the best ways to go about it. And um, Gunner was fine with it, I guess, until the season started, and then he was just like, "I don't care. I'm playing." And we kind of had to talk him down from that, and then. Uh, once we kind of got in the flow of the season and he basically settled on the fact that he was going to be a cheerleader pretty much, that it was, yeah, yeah it was okay. So, so first, how, how difficult was it for you to have to lead your son into the path that didn't have football? It, it really wasn't because I knew where well, – I knew what he was passionate about. I knew what was important to him. Now, you know, I think he – I think everybody realized that his best football was ahead of him. He had just kind of started to grow into his body. Mm -hmm. He started to run better. He started to move better, you know, and, um, I've seen some huddle clips of him taking off and separating. No, no, he can, yeah, he can, he could do a little bit. And, um, you know, I think he was really on the track to have a really good senior. I mean, the guy caught 40 balls as a junior, so it wasn't like he wasn't productive. Yeah. Uh, he's just behind Deshaun Smith who goes to LSU. He's behind Trey Quinn who breaks the national record. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those guys were kind of more featured. And I think his senior year would have been a year where he and Trey would have really kind of been the tandem. And Kennan was still there. And well, you and know, Kennan's his buddy, so he's got a great connection Ken, to begin great with. Great connection. And, and yeah. Kennan was, you know, Kennan was a, like Johnny Manziel. I mean, I'm not, and I, I don't use that term lightly. I mean, the mm-hmm. guy was electric on a football field. I mean, he holds all the state records yeah, I mean, still. He's old. I had a Peyton Manning. Yeah, it's all of, those guys. I yeah. mean, his. Yeah, High school career was illustrious, yeah, it was and humble. and and he and he and Gunner and Trey were obviously really close, still are today, best friends. Um, and I think he'd have had a really good senior year. Yeah, I mean, it was basically it was really, I guess, the people that from returning from my junior year that had played a good bit was yeah. really just me and Trey at the wideout position. Um, I mean, we had some guys step up that hadn't played a ton that had you know pretty good years. Um, but no, I mean, I. I would have, I would have definitely got my fair share of, because yeah. I mean they just they spent the whole year, double and triple team and trade to try and not 
let him have five touchdowns and 300 yards receiving yeah. every week. So and, and yet he still did it. And and he still yeah, did I was about it. to say, yet he yeah, still guy did was, it. The guy was unbelievable. High school player. It was really neat to to watch those guys when they start playing when they're six together. And then, I mean, Trey breaks the national record and the state records. Kennan breaks all the state records as a quarterback to watch those guys, you know, turn into who they turned into when they just started out as kids of six and seven, you know. So, um, they, it was – honestly, it was – it was gave us great peace of mind. And like I said earlier, man, Gunner knew who he was, knew who he wanted to be, still does. And so, you know, he basically – in the doctor's office said, so you're telling me I can still work out, I can still lift, and I can still get ready for baseball season. I just can't play football. And Dr. Marco goes, yeah, that's pretty much it. And he goes, all right, jumped off the table and walked out. That's it. It was all good. <laughs> ready to go. Ready to go. Yeah. So it didn't get hard until they started playing games. At the beginning of the year, you know, he and his mom got into it a couple of times. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care. And it's basically his mom's like, <laughs> his mom's like, I'm not coming to the games and support you if you decide to do this and play. And he's like, I don't care if you support me or not. I'm playing. And so that was a whole big deal. We kind of had to talk him down off of that. But uh, once we got that situated, and and honestly, she never really wanted him to play football anyway. No, she. Uh, but she learned. She understood it later on. You know, um, there was a a mark time in his career where, you know, she wanted him to give it up and just concentrate on baseball. And, you know, we always try to tell her that he'll get a lot more out of football than football will get out of him, mm -hmm. you know. And so, um, you know, there was a, a quarterfinal game at Ponchatoula his sophomore year. And, I mean, it is a freaking all-out war. And these two yeah, teams are going a, at it. The crowd's crazy. Everything's going nuts. And, it, you know, it's, it's playing pretty good in the game. And then, and then all of his baseball buddies – his baseball only buddies are down here, no shirt, chest painted, you know, acting silly, yeah. just whatever. And and I bumped Ashley and I said, "All right, you tell me who's getting more out of tonight, those guys right there, or your son?" And she said, "I completely understand it now." And so, you know, you're playing West Monroe and you're playing Ponchatoula in these high energy, whatever, highly contested games, and then you get to baseball and it's. 400 people mm -hmm. and they're like oh gunner's so calm i'm like yeah well, he, just, he just played west monroe in front of 10,000 people well, in football that, that semifinal game yeah he's not worried about it you know crazy. what i mean so it, it 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 was good for him you know it was good for him all the way around so you talked about sacrifices obviously the sacrifice of giving up football for you it was a sacrifice of making your schedule work so that you could watch this guy in high school and mm -hmm. college play baseball um any moments in your life stand out where you you really had to, to work to get there to watch him pitch? Yeah, man, I, just just a bunch of time. I can remember um, just going back to the Little League World Series. I mean, we were in the middle of August camp. And so um, in between two-a-day practices and stuff, the the regional games were only carried on the radio until they got to the back end. Mm -hmm. So I'm literally like, in the hallway at Magnese with an AM radio laying on the floor trying to find, like, the perfect the angle frequency, just, to, yeah. Yeah, just to listen to the game where they're playing there. Um, and then, you know, I worked for a great guy, man. Coach Vitar was an awesome guy. And when they when they made it to Williamsport, we were getting ready to play North Carolina um, and ultimately played really good in that game. But he came in my office and said, when are you leaving? And I said, what do you mean, when am I leaving? I said, because we're in the middle of two days. I'm not, I'm not leaving. And he you know, and at the time I'm the OC, I'm the quarterbacks coach, I'm all this stuff, and I'm like, I can't just up and leave. You know, I'll just watch it on TV. And he basically told me, if it's a financial thing, I'm going to pay for it, and you're going to go. Mm -hmm. Or if it's not a financial thing, and you're just being stubborn, I'm going to fire you, and you don't have a choice but to go. <laughs> you're not going to have anything else to do. Yeah. So you're going to go. And so we literally, we flew, or I flew. Drove to meet them, watched a couple games. There was a kind of a couple days off. I flew back, did practice for a couple days, and then when they got towards the back end um, and towards kind of these U.S. championship and some of these other deals, I flew back and mm -hmm. was able to watch some of those. So, um, and was in the stadium, you know, for the whole Hawaii debacle and um, you know, kind of managing my wife and all that stuff. And it's funny when you've been around the game like as long as I have, and you know, he went out there. 
and things kind of weren't going his way. And then there's a double play ball, but because we threw the ball to the wrong base, the hitter before, there's not a double play opportunity. Mm -hmm. And you just, when you've seen it enough, you know where it's headed. Yeah. And I just basically told her, I said, you might want to, you might want to leave the stadium. This is not going to end good today. And she's, she's your biggest fan. Right? Yeah. And she's oh, like she's going, crying. you know, she's almost on the verge of tears already. And I just said, this is not going to end good. I'm just telling you. And so um, they took him out of the game and put him at first base. And the guy walking to the plate is a big left-handed hitter. I'm talking about a big donkey. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and I said, this ball is going to be hit to him. And I said, if you don't want to see this, you need to leave. And she got up and left. And sure enough, when it's your day, it's, it's your, your day. day yeah. And you just knew he'd already struck out three times. And it was just his day. And you knew it. And there was nothing that was going to change it that day. And so uh, that was – that was one of the more interesting days in the ballpark. So she's literally underneath the belly of the stadium <laughs> crying, bawling her eyes out. And, you know, I'm just sitting there going, hey, my man, good luck, buddy, because <laughs> the baseball gods are on you today. So that's how yeah. it works. That 2017 season where Gunner had his, his impressive run. Yeah. You get to see all those or you missed a – I got to see a bunch of those. Yeah, I got to see a bunch of those. Um you know, again, the schedule kind of worked out. The only thing, there were some nights where when we actually started spring practice, our schedule was always Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. So for the four weeks we were in spring ball, depending on where he was, you know, there was no shot. And so I listened to the, all those on the radio and um, really have become a huge Jay Walker fan because I've had to listen to so many games more than, than watch, right? Yeah. And so uh, – you know, that, that run, you know, I was able to see. And then, of course, the summer before in the Cape was kind of mm -hmm. able to see. Ashley and I spent about eight or ten days in the Cape with him when he was there for the month or so. And so uh, I got to watch a bunch of it, man. And I've, 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 watched a, I've watched a bunch of good ones and some days not so good. So, But I'm always there, you know, if I can. Let's go to 2015 freshman year. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting year in the fact that you had pretty much all freshmen on the mound, and a lot of y'all didn't have a clue where you were going. But <laughs> somehow, that team was able to make it all the way to Baton Rouge in a Super Regional. Yeah. So, Gunner, what was that like for you? That team, I've been telling a lot of people, that team reminds me so much of this year's team. Um, when you go even player to player, just the similarities between each person and their background and, and just as a team, I mean, how we started – Pretty sure we had almost the same record. It's just crazy. Um, but 2015 was, I mean, I, I knew coming in that I would have a chance to pitch and had a pretty – had a okay fall. Um, finally figured out really how tough it was to do both because I came here as a two-way. And, I mean, at my senior year at Barb, I was able to do both pretty well. Mm -hmm. So I just figured – I mean, I knew we had some older guys – um, position player wise, so I didn't think I would hit a ton, but I mean, just the the guys that can really do it, like the Brendan McKays and the guys that have done it in the past in college baseball. That's, I mean, it's it's really really impressive because the amount of work, at least that we put in, just in the bullpen, and then the amount of work that those guys put in hitting. I mean, the, to juggle that and to be successful doing both is is really remarkable. Um, but I mean, I can remember just. I, mean, I just wanted to pitch. You know, I had never – I had sat some here and there, but, I mean, I was always contributing somehow. So I just – whether it be just getting lefties or just in the bullpen or whatever, it, I just wanted to pitch. And I was – I remember coming out – I was the first guy in relief um, Friday night at UTSA um, and threw – I think I threw like eight straight curveballs, which I, I – I mean, that was – it's still not even – really a great pitch for me I've never done that in my life you know so yeah I, I wasn't even prepared for that and thank God it worked out I ended up I think I struck that guy out by the grace of God um but um I remember that and then we were on the road trip back and <clears throat> there was some talk about me starting the midweek game against Northwestern and I didn't really know how to handle it's like I wanted to go up to coach Rob and be like am I going to start am I going to start like a little kid but I just kind of tried to keep my distance, and he came up to me on the way back. We were at a gas station, and he was like, he's like, you can get the ball um, at Northwestern. And I was, like, ecstatic, like beyond excited. Um, and started that game, had a pretty good um, had a pretty good start, five innings. I think I got – pretty sure I got the win that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it was your first college win. I yeah, 
my high school coach, Coach Shakini was there. My high school coach drove down and watched yeah. it. Um, so it was cool. I mean, it was that was uh, that was definitely a cool experience. And then, I mean, like you said, we had Evan. I think Evan was on Friday nights at that point. Um, mm-hmm. Wyatt was coming out of Pandemo. It was man, there were times where we would go freshman to freshman to freshman or fre- like I mean there'd be three or four freshmen in a row. Um, so, but yeah, I remember that Northwestern start. Um, and then I think I got the next midweek start against McNeese. And mm-hmm. It was that was like the 19 inning. That was a debacle. And that, and that was your like last. Yeah. That was right? crazy. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, they told me, they Which told me they really, won't. It was really cold. It was freezing. You only started a couple innings, played pitched a couple innings, and then yeah, it was they, like a 19 inning game. And I remember we came in for it to watch them start. Uh huh. And. They were leaving to go to Alabama that weekend, and my wife is like, we're not leaving this game until I see them because they're going on the road trip, so we're staying. <laughs> and then it goes 19 innings, and it's, it's like It's third freezing. Yeah, it was yes. freezing. And so I'm just sitting up there like, all right, he's done after two innings. So you're watching 17 innings of baseball just so she can give him a hug and a kiss, but like a little – you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just like, man, let's go home. It's almost back to Little League no, ball no, again. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> No doubt. That's no, funny. You know, you want to bring him a power aid and a sneakers yeah. before we leave. Too. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? So yeah, I remember that, and um, then the next one was Alabama on That's Sunday. Right. Alabama on Sunday, um, which was, I guess, kind of when I guess I I felt like I belonged maybe a little bit, or like mm-hmm. felt that I was because there was times, especially in the fall, where just like the grind of doing both and all the workload, and I, mean, I would go up on the mountain, I would just be, I mean like dog tired like exhausted i mean there was there was an outing in the fall where i gave up 10 runs in two innings like i literally like it did not matter what i threw where i threw it mm-hmm. everybody was getting a hit and so i mean there was times where i was kind of like what did i get myself into you know because that didn't i don't think i've had ever done that in my career yeah. really um well and then that, that alabama weekend was a big one because coach yeah. robichaud got a thousandth win yeah and then you turned it over into a series win at alabama yeah it was I, i'm about to say i remember I guess that was like the first. I mean, Alabama was nat- was nationally ranked, and I mean it's SEC, it's Alabama, and so that was kind of like, I guess, the first almost just kind of thrown into the fire about with as far as like legitimate Division One baseball was yeah. concerned. Um, no, but I mean I was. That was almost kind of like the stars align. I mean I. I can remember me and Thurman were just locked in. I mean I I don't even really remember thinking a ton in that game. Like I mean. I was listening to Thurman just because he was the junior, the senior, and I was the freshman. But, I mean, we were – I mean, I was spotting up, and I was – I mean, I was getting outs, and, I mean, we were scoring. I think we won that game like 16-1 to 1 or whatever yeah. it was. Mm-hmm. They scored their um, first inning. They had base hitting the triple yeah, in the first inning. Yeah. And then that was, and then much that was it, locked down. Yeah, I don't yeah. think they got another hit the rest of the day. Yeah, so that was um, – I guess that, that definitely gave me some confidence. I mean, that – like I said, that was uh, – that was the first time where I kind of believed that I belonged, you know. Fast forward to the regional at Houston. That was a, a really tough one to get out of. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was nuts. I mean, Houston, that turf field, and it's felt like 150 degrees. I mean, it was smoldering hot. Well, um, and you had to match up against Seth Romero, who yeah, was and I lights even, out. About to say we, or at least I didn't know who he was, and then I come in. And he's throwing – I'm sitting in the dugout, and people are oohing and on in the dugout. I'm like, what? I look up, and he's threw a fastball like 99. <laughs> I was like, good Lord. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, matching up against him and, and just the – there what I mean, I, from what I can remember, there wasn't really – the atmosphere wasn't as crazy, I guess. I guess, I mean, after that I went to Alex Box, so nothing compares to that. But mm-hmm. – um, wasn't really the atmosphere or anything. I was just kind of battling with myself. <clears throat> I, I mean, I didn't feel great. It was, it was hot. I, I mean, I was tired. Didn't really have my best stuff. But again, probably got lucky a handful of times. I can remember the bases being loaded, and I think I threw like an 82 or 83 mile an hour fastball right down the middle of the plate, and the guy popped it up. It supposed to be in, and got ended up getting out of that jam. And there was a handful of things that happened that kind of just went my way that day. And I mean, it worked out. That whole that whole regional was I mean we were winning games and I don't even think we knew how we were winning games you know I mean sure getting hit by the pitch mm-hmm. and, I, mean, I think Seth Romero no hit us to the eighth or the ninth wasn't it it was right? the eighth it was the oh, eighth yeah. and it was a check swing on Powell that Evan Powell probably went yep 
and they called him or they said no and he got a hit in the six hole if i'm not mistaken that's right and they pulled him after that and then the next I guess guy the rest is history. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, and Shug got hit. And, the, it fell apart at the end. Yeah. The greatest yeah. bat flip in yeah. UL baseball history. That bat flip almost took <laughs> Coach Talbot out. That was crazy. So you, so you had the regional, and then <clears throat> the next week was when really your name got put on a national stage. I mean, people knew yeah. of you regionally. Yeah. But your performance at LSU, and I know you didn't win the game. Yeah. But you sure made people stand up and realize – Gunnar Leger is a freshman at LSU, making them fight for every hit. Yeah. And uh, I knew, um, I mean, I guess you hear about the crowds. And the, and I had been to some LSU games. I hadn't, I don't think I'd ever been, when I had been on, a, when I went on that recruiting visit, yeah. I had been once. Yeah, versus um, Arkansas. Berkin, they versus playing. Arkansas. Yeah. Um, I mean, you hear how how tough that crowd is and, and the atmosphere mm-hmm. and everything. and. I mean, in the Sun Belt, you you'll hear some things here and there when you're warming up and stuff. But <laughs> I can remember getting on the mound to start warming up for that game, and I mean, there's there's like grown men, like 55 year old men, saying stuff that I can't even remotely say on this <laughs> on this radio show um, or this podcast. Um, so I mean, that was I mean, I, I, that really never bothered me. I thought that was kind of funny, but I mean, they were getting after me. Um, and I mean, I guess when, once the game started. I mean, I just kind of almost like not blacked out, but I was just focused and I didn't really realize everything that was going on around me. And I mean, sure, we you know we get had the butterflies and stuff, but I mean, once the first pitch, you know, was thrown or once I once I threw my first pitch, everything kind of calmed down and I was just pitching. And then I want to say it was the I don't know, like the fifth or something. It was still scoreless, and you know, the crowd's starting to get going, trying to get them going. And it was the seventh, I can, actually, sixth to the seventh. I can so. remember them. They do, like, their LSU mm-hmm. Tigers, and, they, you know, it goes around the, the stadium. The whole stadium starts and, going. I mean, there's yeah. 15,000 people yelling it. And I, like, literally, Thurman's calling a pitch, and I step off, and I'm like, holy, like, oh, my God. <laughs> it hits you again. kind of realized, I guess, the situation where we were at and all that well, stuff. And you had gotten pretty good defense behind you in that game. Yeah, Obviously, Clem, BT Clement. and Kyle yeah. Clement, they yeah. they both were yeah. unbelievable that Joe game. Robbins yeah. made some plays Joe, at third. Yeah. I mean, no, there were some sure. real guys no, making sure. plays. Definitely some things that, that were going our way for sure. Um, and then I think, <clears throat> was it, I don't know if it was Savick that hit the home run. Yeah, was Savick it Savick? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was made just, I think that was a like a 3-1 it was like a three-one fastball. I thought I thought he was going to be sitting change up, so Thurman just called fastball down and away. I mean, it was a little over the plate, but I just kind of tried to get it in there. I didn't think he was going to be looking for that, and I mean, he was for he was. sure. Yeah. yeah, no, that ball was that ball was a no doubter. Um, and then the honestly the the only thing I can remember after that is the balk to put the guy in scoring position. Yeah. And then I think I ended up walking a guy, or that guy got on first. And then I can remember Robe coming to the mound and just telling me. I thought he was coming to pull me out because I knew he had guys warming Millie up. Millie was hot, yeah. I thought Millie was hot. Millie I thought he was going to pull pull me to face Bre- for Millhorn to face Bregman. Um, and he came to me and he was just like, "How you feel?" I was like, "I feel fine." He was like, "I want you to throw three change ups low and away." You know, I was like, "I want you to throw straight change ups low and away off the plate." He was like, "Just try and get him to fish, get him on the ground." I was like, "All right, let's go." And I mean, I, 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 from what I can remember, I spotted it up pretty well. You know, I'm pretty sure it was down and off the plate. And mm-hmm. He reached over and got it, and I can remember jumping, and it was like slow motion. Like I just saw it go right, out, right over my glove, um, and then turned around, and it barely snuck through there, and <clears throat> ran behind home plate, and they, you know, the run score, a few more, few run score, whatever it was, mm-hmm. um, and him coming to pull me, and I guess the rest is history. But um, that was, uh, I guess that was, if if the Little League thing didn't happen and I was put in that same situation, I wouldn't have handled that situation like I did. You know, I mean, I was still, I mean, I was shook up. I was obviously not happy and, and all that and, and pissed off. But um, I guess I realized that, you know, I mean, I execute my pitch. I mean, that guy's the number two overall pick. But I execute my pitch and it squeaks through. You know, it happens. Um, baseball happened. Um, and so I was, I guess, able to move on from that a little bit easier than maybe I would have if I hadn't had some things in my past that 
led me to that point. Well, so, My phone went off all week leading into that because, you know, there's so many LSU people and so many UL people and everybody's involved and, and it becomes important, you know, because of the magnitude of the opportunity to go to mm -hmm. Omaha. And they basically would, you know, the question was always, how is he going to handle Alex Box? How is he going to handle Alex Box? And I just, my response was always, you know, I don't know if his stuff's going to be good enough. I don't know if he can get him out, but I know that he's going to do everything he can to put himself in position to be successful leading going in. And, I, you know, I, I would tell people, you know, it doesn't matter if he's throwing against Lafayette High School or the New York Yankees. The mm -hmm. routine's going to be the same. So he's going to be ready to go. Whether it's good enough or not, I don't know. We'll find out when he gets out there, but he'll be ready to go. So, um, and that's kind of who he is as a person and a player, you know. He's always put himself in position to be successful by the way he goes about his business, you know. I actually found out after – <clears throat> After the fact, Suge told me, so whenever Bregman was coming up that inning or after all that stuff had happened, I think they were actually coming to pull me, and Robe turned around, and Suge was just, I guess, standing behind the coaches. I think Robe turned to the coaches and said something along the lines of, like, what do you think? You know, what should we do? Do we pull him? Do we leave him in? And Suge said, Suge said something like, he's our effing guy. He said, he's got us here. Just leave him in. And so he told me that after the story. I, I always I thought that was a cool story, though, um, especially from Shug, who I, mean, I love and respect to death. Um, wish he was still here coaching with us. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it could have been Millhorn or it could have been um, – the situation could have been completely different. But um, the fact that – I mean, and Coach Robes still had the final decision. The fact that he trusted me enough to leave me in when I was 18 years old in that situation is pretty cool. Mm hmm you talked about being blown up on the phone uh, for that game. But along the way, there's been kind of an unspoken rivalry between you two. Not that you played each other, but at some point you'd always get the question asked, well, who are you pulling for yeah, today, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. How how many times and, and how was that for you? I mean, obviously you didn't play each other. Yeah. But in one way or another, the schools played each other when you were at different schools, and it got even yeah. more intense when you were at the rival schools. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's always been co a common deal. Uh, we've always, I think, you know, it was bigger for the yeah, fans. Yeah, it was and... bigger for everybody else than it was for us. We yeah. just kind of laughed about it and and made jokes about it. And when uh, I guess when I got to Monroe, people wore me out about it so much. I was just like, all right, we'll give them something, and you know, threw that hat bet thing out there. But I mean, he was playing here, coming to the Magnes games, coming to ULM games, wearing our gear while he was there. You know, supporting me. A um, mm -hmm. little bit different. Um, for me a little bit, uh, I just always tried to wear black. I just tried to stay neutral and not get in the middle of it because – Not get caught. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, we had um, media people and uh, PR people and all that at some of the other places. You know, you're going to be on TV tonight, don't have on the this, that, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I thought it was always more important for me to be there – in person supporting than who what shirt I had on or what hat I had on or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, I just try to stay neutral and just support my guy, you know, just let it go what it is, what it is, you know. I think that was definitely a bigger thing for everybody else. Everybody else. For us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I, like he said, I mean, when <clears throat> I feel like it wasn't really that big of a deal when you were at McNeese, I guess, because we were in this, not in the same conference or anything, but um, it did escalate a little bit it when did. I got to Monroe. When you, yeah, when you got to Mon Monroe. And I, I guess I didn't even really realize, I guess, the rivalry that was ULM and UL mm -hmm. really until I got a few years into here. Um, yeah, but yeah, that was uh, I don't know, it was just funny, all the little – yeah. Well, it, you, knew, you knew the questions were coming, right? Yeah. Like, yeah no, when no, you no. got when you got called for an interview, you were like, "Oh, I know what this is going to be. Yeah, yeah, this go. is going to be about that." Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So, you take the success from that freshman year, and it molded you into the player you turned into in 2017. Um, let's go back to the almost no hitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, that I, that night, what I mean, what was running through your mind, and and did you even do you even remember every pitch? No, I mean I obviously remember the hit, the pitch that I threw to give up the hit, and then I I remember, I don't remember what inning it was, but I threw two decent pitches, and they hit a line drive to left, like like smoked it, 
right at Kinnon. And then the next pitch was a line drive to Castles. Like, dang, mm-hmm. I'm near the same pitch mm-hmm. in the same <clears throat> same spot, just opposite part of the field, and smoked it. And, I mean, right at him, caught it. And I, was, I think it might have been the seventh. It was late in the game. Mm-hmm. And, I I mean, I had realized that I hadn't given up any hits. And and when both of those took place, I was like, maybe maybe it's just meant to happen. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's just meant to happen. Um, so I remember those two pitches. And then the last pitch actually – I threw it, but it's I shook Handsome off. If 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 I would have went with what he called, he called pretty sure he called fastball in, and I shook because I was like, if I give this up, I'm just gonna give it up with my best pitch. So I shook the change up off the plate, and I mean it wasn't it wasn't a bad pitch. He just Flicked he went down there. and got it. He couldn't um, have thrown it out there any better. No, into yeah, the empty part of the field. Um, I know. I mean, it is what it is. It was. Uh, I mean, other than I mean, I think I threw like a five inning no hitter in that regional mm-hmm. um but i mean I, you know it's not I mean, the stage was different you know it's it was cool it was um the <laughs> i don't know how people handled it on a big league level as far as i mean if i was throwing a no hitter in a big league game and we got to the ninth i mean i i really like it. i'm sitting in the dugout and i didn't know what to do with myself especially when we got to the eighth i was sitting there no one's talking to you everyone it's quiet as can be you know, and everyone knows what's going on. I think that makes it more awkward. It does. Like, just, no, just does. do what you normally do. No, but, like, know? no one – people are, like, you know, like, peeking. You can see people peeking and looking at they you. They were like, afraid yeah, to mess like it up, were right? they were afraid to say something or, I guess, break the focus. Or, But, I mean, I had already broken the focus because I was trying to figure out what to do with myself. Um, so when you walk back in – normally when you walk back into the dugout after an inning, everybody's yeah. there to greet you, right? Yeah. So you get the high five, and then from that point on it was yeah. silence? yep. Yep, it was after about – after that seventh inning, like coming in after the seventh, it was – I mean, they high-fived me, you know, all that. And sat down, and, I mean, I'm talking about nobody came near me. I mean, <laughs> nobody. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was different. It was unique for sure. In that moment, Tim, who was more nervous, you or your wife? I don't know. She, she tends to stay, like, down the third base line kind of out of everything. I move. I kind of move all over the place. Mm-hmm. So I'll watch a couple innings up there to just get a feel for you know his movement and how he looks and all that stuff. And then eventually I'll move behind home plate, like right there, uh, you know, behind those seats uh-huh. and stand back there, kind of in the concourse and watch. And that way I can kind of see how the ball's moving and all that stuff. And so um, you know I move around a little bit. So I, how she was handling it, I know how she – everything's everything's a 1,000 miles an hour for yeah. her. So she's a nervous wreck no matter what. Yeah, she right? was, she's, a, she's an emotional roller coaster. Um, and so – but for me down there, I watched the game. It was, you know, I think uh, Coach Rope's son Judd was there. Hunter Moody was there. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. Scott Hawkins, you know, guys that have been productive players here. We're just kind of down there talking ball. You get through the course of the game and then, you know, you start to realize, like, he's got a perfect game here. And then you hit the dude right in the leg to start an inning, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You're going to give up. <laughs> I, mean, I figured, yeah. I, figured I would. hit a guy. Well. You know, and then and then, um, then he got out of that. That was, you know, next pitch was a double play or something, and it was like, all right, well, maybe we're – Still got know, a we, chance. Yeah, we get this thing. And then we get two outs, and then you see him pinch hit a guy, and in my head I'm like, this is always the guy. Like, this guy's not any good. He's probably just getting that bat in his blowout win, and he'll be the kind of guy that he's just going to throw the bat yeah, at the he's ball. He's going to throw the bat out there, and he took got a couple really bad swings, and then he flicked. That I made change some. Up. I made some some really good pitches. I think there was two fastballs that were like, I don't want to say no doubt strikes, but I mean he had given them to me throughout the game, and he didn't call him that at bat. And I'd say Robe was. I've never seen Robe, I guess, mad at an umpire for a. A personal thing, you know, about a player, you know, player home success. run or strikeout, you know, yeah. yeah, player success. But he was, he was pissed. He, <laughs> I mean, I was walking off the field and he's walking behind me, just yelling at him, wearing him out. He wore him out in the dugout. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a, it was crazy. Yeah. It was a, it was a cool the, experience. The really so. neat thing though is, is the how the fans embraced it, mm-hmm. got into it, and yeah. you know they're on their feet for the last three outs. And I mean, you could feel the energy. Although the game wasn't close, you know the way that, um, 
you know, the fans at the Teague are always into the game and they're knowledgeable and they understand what's going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. But, but they're they're realizing like this is this is maybe historical the, almost. Uh, yes, yeah, this is an historical deal. Then this may be the third or fourth time in program's history that it's going to happen and this looks like it's going to happen and they start getting into it and I think probably for him more than him throwing the no-hitter and being able to say, "Hey, I did that." You know, to see the way Handsome was into it and the way the fan base was into it and then ultimately you lose it with two outs and two strikes in the ninth. I think probably, um, you know, not being able to do that for the fans and because those, I mean, you know, the his experience here, and I tell kids that in recruiting all the time, you know, my son's had a great experience, a really good experience here. The people have been great. His, you know, he's had a good career, but the way he's been treated by Coach Robe and, and the people – uh, in, in Cajun Nation, um, if you have half the experience he had, you're going to have a great career here. Mm-hmm. And so we can speak to that personally to recruits. And, and I think that night was kind of almost like him wanting to give back to them for everything they had given him, you know. So I uh, wish it could have worked out, but, you know, one pitch away, man. It's baseball, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just fast forward through that season. You had a, an incredible stretch where you didn't give a run for all, yeah. four games. Um, you get on the Golden Spike semifinalist award, first person in the school's history to do that. What, what was running through your head when you found out about that? And in that season, just give me a, a per, uh, cliff note says what that was like for you. Uh, the Golden Spikes thing, I mean, it was just an honor for for me and for the university and for my family and really for everybody. I mean, when you kind of track back and think about some of the guys that have played here and some of the careers that people have had. I mean, BT, um, Lou Croy, Ron Gidge. I mean, you just start thinking about all the people that played here, Danny Farquhar. Um, to be the first to do that is is pretty pretty remarkable. It's pretty cool. Um, so I, I that was just that was just an honor to be <laughs> be even put in the same name or with all those names um, that was it 25 guys or something yeah, like that? Um, I mean, you're talking about Casey Mize, who's the number one overall pick, Joey Bart, who's number two. I mean, you start running through all those names. I think Magical was on there. There's a lot of dudes on there. Um, so from that aspect, that was – I mean, that was pretty cool. And from the aspect of all the people that have played here that that didn't do it, you know, um, is is really pretty remarkable. Um, but the, 20, the 2017 season was um, – I mean, obviously it was, you know, it was good. It was, it was fun. I mean, I was throwing well. Um, I guess, uh, I guess something that a lot of people don't know is just, I guess the battle that I was kind of almost having with myself, just with some of the arm stuff that I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. Um, Now looking back, knowing what I know now and the feelings that I had, honestly, I think I'd, I'd heard it or it flared up. I don't know if it tore during that outing or whatever, but it had kind of, come to the forefront probably the second spring scrimmage before that year even started, before Southeastern, um, or not. It ended up being Murray State. But that's honestly when it – and it wasn't even really bad in the beginning of the year. Um, it was just something little um, kind of bugging me here and there. And progressively through the season, it just got worse and worse. It really didn't get bad until Little Rock and after Little Rock, which was – Halfway point. That mm-hmm. was – yeah. Um, so – I mean, obviously it was – the 2017 season was fun, I guess, personally. I mean, we kind of had our ups and downs. Um, but, yeah, that that was a battle in itself. And, again, it kind of – my whole life I've never really listened to my body, you know, I guess as far as health is concerned. Like, you know, if, if I have something here or there, something little, I mean, if I can get through it and fight through it, if it's not affecting how I'm getting outs or doing what I need to do, I'll just do it and push it to the side and – that was probably a case where obviously I shouldn't have done that. Um, but I mean, even then, I mean, I still kind of went through the, almost the protocol. I mean, even, I mean, I was having the little form stuff and I mean, I'm trying to ask guys who have had the surgery, who have had problems trying to figure out if the feelings that I was having was something similar to what they had. Cause I had never had arm problems. I had had no idea what even entailed that as far as, you know, UCL tears or whatever it may be. Um, so I was trying to figure that out by itself um ended up getting seen by our doctor um doing different stuff you keep going um doing different stuff like that 
And uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought a little bit. Um, what was that? UCL, talking you're talking about. So you were talking about. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. The, the, so the arm. I, I ended up seeing Dr. Duvall, just kind of telling him what I was feeling. Um, told him that you know where I was feeling and all that stuff. And I mean, he took me through a whole. I mean, like the whole test, you know, all the manual stuff that you can test for. Um, he did it, and I passed. And, I mean, I really had no pain through any of it. And so I was like, maybe it's just, you muscular. know, a little forearm thing, yeah. muscular something. So just kept getting treatment, kept doing stuff. And what was tough through all of it was that I was, I mean, I was throwing the best. I was having a stretch where I was throwing the best in my career, really consistently, week in and week out. I mean, I was still con commanding the ball. My velocity was was a little down, but it, it, I mean, it was kind of up and down. You know, I mean, there was innings where I was normal, you know, some innings where I wasn't, but it wasn't like so drastic to where you, you know, you hear guys throwing that are not, you know, 90 to 94, and then they're throwing 75 or something yeah. crazy. Um, so I never really, I never had that really until the end of the year. Um, but yeah, just the trying to figure out what was going on throughout that whole year and then. You know, you pass the manual test and all this stuff, and it's still kind of sticking around. And then Little Rock, you know, I throw a good bit of pitches at Little Rock, and it just, after that, it just kind of went downhill in a hurry. Um, and, I mean, in the conference tournament, in the conference tournament, I mean, I was, that's kind of, I guess, when I knew in my head that something wasn't right. I didn't know, again, I still, I mean, we didn't have an MRI. We didn't have anything. I still didn't know that it was my UCL or whatever it may be, but um, definitely didn't feel right. Um, I mean, it, I mean, I was throwing. I think I was throwing seventy eight, seventy eight to eighty. Yeah. And I mean, I haven't done that. It's mostly eighty two the whole time, and then they got the bases loaded, and you kind of geared up to get out of the jam. And then the next inning, the first pitch you threw was seventy eight miles an hour, and I was like, oh man. Yeah. This so. Good. And I mean, like you said, I mean, like geared up, like I. It was like I, I could do it. You know, I didn't. And in game, there's so much adrenaline. Like, if I push for like. I, the velo was there and I could get it there, mm -hmm. but it was like usually I can just kind of play catch up there and it's at least mid eighties, you know, somewhere eighty four to eighty six. Um, but it wasn't. <laughs> whenever I was playing catch, it was like you said, it was seventy eight. Yeah. Um, well, and it has to kill you because you were you were dominating that game. Yeah. yeah well, it was yeah. kind of the perfect storm though. Like as far as he never could really piece it all together because the performance was still good. Mm -hmm. And when he got it looked at, you know, he was passing all these tests every time they put him through it. And then in his head, part of it was like, I didn't prepare well enough because he threw in the Cape the previous summer. Mm -hmm. So when he came back, a rope shut him down. So he really didn't throw all fall leading into the year. And so, so he didn't have he, that build up. He didn't have the build up. And in his mind, he was getting sore and tight because his body wasn't ready for what he was asking it yeah, to do. I so he kept just... saying, Dad, you know, I, you know, I didn't ramp up enough. I'm not ready. I'm going to have to throw through it. He kept, you know, thinking in those terms the whole time. And then it just kept lingering and lingering and lingering. And, and really nobody knows. And I don't think, you know, he did a really good job of keeping it from everybody. Coach Rogue, you know, everybody yeah. <laughs> um, that – and I can remember the scrimmage, and he called. I called him, and I said, hey, how'd you throw today? It's not great. He said, "He said my forearm's tight, man. It doesn't feel right. I'm having a hard time straightening my arm and all that. And this is two weeks before the season even started. Yeah. So when you look at 2017, and when you look back and to think of what he did, I mean, he's 10-2. and two, He's on the Golden Spikes list. And, I mean, the guy literally threw the whole year hurt. And then probably half of potentially it with a torn with the, yeah, yeah, potentially, potentially with a torn UCL torn half, the, half the year. And to be that dominant. In it's that crazy, shape. man. It's just yeah. it's crazy. And and the thing for him, too, is, you know, he was never a a, a high velocity guy going up. The velocity just kind of came in the summer in the Cape. You know, it, it was probably jumped two three miles an hour in the Cape yeah, working I mean, with Coach was... Lawler and and then kind of some of the things that you know he's a little bit stronger, he's a little bit older, he's starting to mature, and so it kind of all came together in the Cape. And then he comes back, and the and it starts out where it's it's like that, and so. He had never thrown his career with velocity. He was just gaining that velocity. Mm -hmm. And so when he didn't have it, even on a night where he felt tight he and he's throwing 84. Didn't think he, anything of it. It don't matter. You just yeah. use the okay. change up and you manipulate the ball. And and so not a lot of people realize, but that's kind of who he's been his whole career. And so I, it's part of the reason, you know, I just kind of became the guy that encouraged him is I can distinctly remember um, when he was a sophomore, he's at Barb throwing against Bird. 
and they have a center fielder who's a really good player. And um, I'm sitting behind home plate, and he's pitching around 80, maybe, tops as a sophomore. And all of a sudden, the three of the fastballs jump up to 84. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. So that night when we got home, I said, hey, man, if you, if you want to be a Division One pitcher, like everybody's coming here to put these guns on you. And at the time, you know, he's talking to Vanderbilt. He's, I mean, he's talking to a bunch of people, right? Yeah. Because they all think it's coming. And I'm like, dude, if you want to be that guy and you can throw 84, you need to throw 84. And he just, I mean, he looked right at me without hesitation. He's like, it takes a lot of effort for me to throw that hard. And I can throw up there at 80. And if I move my thumb here, the ball will do this. If I move my thumb there, the ball will do that. And he goes, I don't have to really try hard to get those guys out if I move the ball. And he's 16 years old. And I'm like, all right, this dude's got it figured out a little bit here. So I'm just going to back <laughs> off and let him do his <laughs> let thing. Him do his I thing. just kind of let it ride. But that's who he's been his whole career. So when he got hurt in 2017, he just manipulated the ball and got people out, and it didn't matter. You know what I mean? And so um, – It wasn't the velocity that was getting the job done. It wasn't done. the velocity getting the job done anyway. Now in the Cape the summer before, I mean, when he's up there pitching from 87 to 91 the whole time and he was up to 93 in the Cape Cod All-Star game – you know, it's a max effort deal. You know, yeah, like I mean, even in the Cape Cod All Star game, the, I was just yeah trying to let it fly. I mean, there was yeah. eighty guns back there. Yeah. Which that that adrenaline was getting of. in you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, he called the night before, and he was on three in, three inning stints uh, in the Cape. And so, Casey Mize, who was one one, Gunner and Zach Pop, who was a draft pick the year. I mean, those three guys yeah. threw on the same day, and Gunner's like. The crafty lefty. In I the was middle. wedged in between two guys that threw 100 miles an yeah, hour. Literally, yeah, literally like, hundreds. So. And, and you're yeah. sitting there thinking, yeah. man, I'm low man on the totem pole. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Casey Mize is like, Lazy, I think I'm going to pump some 96s today just for fun. Like, <laughs> he's just throwing yeah. as hard as he wants. It's for casual. Fun. Yeah, it's casual. Yeah, casual he's playing 96. Cash. But um, so the velo really had just kind of come. And so when he didn't have it, even when he was going through the issues, he just manipulated the the swings you know yeah that whole I mean yeah that whole year was like he said I looking back I mean I just I kept it from everybody one because I really didn't know and I was it was just so confusing because I was passing the test but I was still having the problems and it just kind of wouldn't go away and like you said I thought it was I didn't throw all fall so I kind of was almost kind of on my own plan as far as when I wanted to start throwing again leading into that season so I started kind of toward the end of the fall, just on my own, not in games or anything. And I just thought it was because of that, like the the ramp up of me getting on a mound and throwing pitches at, you know, max effort or close to max effort was just wearing on me a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I and, I mean, even like when I got the evaluation, the first evaluation, I mean, we, we spoke about MRI, but, I mean, Dr. Duvall, we were both like, you know, I had no pain. All my range of motion was fine. And he was like, I just don't think it's necessary right now. And I was like, I mean, I agree. You know, I was I was fine with that. I agree. Um, so it was just a, like he said, it was almost just a perfect storm of stuff that happened that was just a, a weird situation. And I, I probably, I mean, I could have been more upfront with a lot of people throughout the whole situation, but my whole life kind of was leading to that year. Not, I almost said, but... Everything that I had worked for was right in front of me, mm -hmm. I should say, with the draft and everything. And, you know, I'd had the f two good years and then threw really well in the Cape and the velo was starting to come. And so people, you know, people started talking about top five rounds and all this stuff. And so I kind of almost got infatuated with that a little bit. And almost like I'd, I just kind of almost wanted to let it play out and see what happened instead of potentially derailing it before it even got to that point just because it had been – 20 years in the making or whatever it had been um so but yeah, i mean it was it was a a mental battle and a and a physical battle um yeah. really that whole year was unique how much should the cape uh make you a better pitcher oh uh i mean i was lucky enough my pitching coach was uh coach lawler who i think he had, he had been at a and m for 20 yeah, years USA, I mean, he's been all over the place been in the big leagues and and then my head coach was Jerry Weinstein, who is, I mean, yeah. he really, yeah, I was about to say, baseball. if you know anything about <laughs> he's baseball. He's been doing it for a long time. Years. Yeah, I mean, he's Literally. he's a legend. Um, and so, I mean, I, I mean, I can remember we, <laughs> we were about the only team, I guess, just because of how Jerry was. I mean, we would show up at, at 10, 
ten thirty, do some work, like some early work, individual work with either your position coach or just whatever. Um, then we'd break for lunch at like eleven, eleven to twelve, twelve thirty. Come back. I mean, and given we don't play till five, and then we would do more work, like more early work, have like a short team practice, then go into BP. I mean, like my days were. I mean, basically it was minor league baseball. It was. It was. Mm-hmm. It, was, it, was, it, was it was. When he told me the schedule, the schedule was very similar to what we did when I was in rookie league with all the high school guys. You go in, you do all your early work, you practice, you do all that stuff, you have lunch, you come back, you do a little more, and then you play a game in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It was Jerry treated it as like lower level minor league development. He was there to coach. Some of those guys were just there kind of just enjoying the summer. Um, But but the, the, the thing with both of those guys was they were really I mean, they were really good to Gunner, yeah, they and they were, really and good. they're still very good. They check on him now to this day. Um, so their relationships that he built there were were really cool. And then, of course, him and Casey Myers text pretty much every day. I mean, their yeah, best me, friends, him, and Joey Bart. Me, you Casey, know. and Joey are. That's what crazy. What's crazy is that team. Looking back, and I know. I mean, if if I guess if you're going to the Cape majority of everybody's roster is going to get drafted, yeah, and yeah. they're very good. I Missed mean, the best players in the country besides the. 25 that go to Team USA or however many it is. Um, but, I mean, we had – it was me, Casey, Casey Mize, Joey Bart, Gavin Sheets, who was a third-round pick. Um, Zach Pop was a top-10 round. I mean, we had, we had probably dudes. 15 top-10 round picks. Yeah. It was just crazy. I mean, and then, of course, it just so happened, me, Casey – I mean, Joey Bart, I didn't have a car, so Bart was basically my taxi everywhere. And he brought his <laughs> car, so – we, had, we were staying at different host homes, and so I would call them and be like, you got to pick me up, you know, if we were going to the field or going wherever. Um, so me, him, and Casey got got pretty close. And like he said, I mean, we still – we have a group text together, and, and we talk, you know, if not every day, every other day, every few days. Um, so, no, it was – that whole experience was way more than what I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. I just assumed that it was, you know, you go up there, it's a bunch of high-level prospects, you just kind of – you show showcase yourself. The scouts are there, and then you get out of there. You know, almost like a business trip. It's similar. less individual yeah. than you thought it was. Yeah, oh my gosh, it's that community is. I mean, it's obviously very small, and I was I wasn't even really like Wareham's not even the gateway on the city, Cape. It's it almost is. the gateway to the Cape. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, everyone on that that whole that whole little horn is. I mean, they're infatuated with it. I mean, See, it's they really cool. love it. I, I would encourage anybody that is a baseball fan. To, to to make a trip and just try to see just some see the state, cape, you know, yeah. hyenas and just go just down. Just hit and every because I mean they're all within an hour of yeah, each other. Just you spend ride a week the train down and just go go to a game. It is at every really place. it is really cool. Well, it's, it's, the other thing too, I think for him is you know he kind of had that validating moment as a freshman, maybe at uh, where did you say it was at at Alabama, at Alabama. Mm-hmm. right? I think. You know, there was some validation that took place in the Cape, too, that kind of led to 2017 happening. And not a lot of people, you know, again, we're kind of throwing it all out there. But, um, you know, there was a point in the summer when he first got up there where he throws his first bullpen for this pitching coach and this guy that's been in professional baseball 55 years. And and Jerry basically looks at him and says, I don't know if what you got is good enough for this league. Yeah, he, did basically well, tell me that. He, he basically just said, look, man, there's these guys are going to be up here pumping 95 and – you're, you know, you're throwing 87, and you know you're gonna have to be really careful and spot up. And I mean, he's just like basically. Com- Looking back, I think he almost because it was really it was it was an individual meeting. He had individual meetings with every players or every player was the coaching staff, Jerry and everybody, and it was basically just a one on one meeting. Um, and he was it's almost like an interview. I mean, he was running running you through a series of questions. He gave you a minute, and he wanted you to talk through your life, basically just. Tell me who you are as a person and whatever. And this was a, a week or two into me and or me being there, and so I'd already thrown a pin, a few pins. Um, and at the end, I I don't think it was more that he was like attacking me or like coming at me. I think he was almost almost kind of like challenging me. Looking back on him, mean, at first I was upset. I was I called him. I was like crying. I was shook up. I was kind of like get me out of here. I don't want to be here type of deal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then almost just kind of made the decision at first because of how I took it in spite of him, almost kind of like I'm going to go do this in front and, and shove it in everybody's face. And then throughout the summer, I mean, we got we got really, really close. Yeah. Coach Lawler and Coach, uh, Coach Weinstein. Yeah. Um, and so he's – they were they were unbelievable. Yeah, it's kind of unique and 
Ashley and I were kind of set to go later in the summer once he kind of got rolling. And you know, after that interview with Coach uh, with Jerry, he he has no car. Yeah. He's like one of the last guys at the field. Everybody's left, and so he's got to walk like a mile home basically. Yeah. So he's walking through the Cape on a back road uh, to the house in the neighborhood, and he freaking calls and he he was crying. I mean, he said, you know, basically, you know, I thought I was coming here to kind of you know, just throw and do whatever. And they're, you know, this guy's questioning my stuff and I'm so tired. I feel like I've everywhere I go, I have to prove it over and over and over. And, you know, I think I've earned the right to be respected. And he kind of felt disrespected. And, mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing was, I mean, he was emotional. And basically, you know, um, I just told him, I said, hey, man, if you want a plane ticket, I'll buy you one and come home. But if you come home, you know, everything you've worked for to this point, you know, you're you're basically telling them that, you're you realize enough. you're not good enough, and you're gonna come home. Yeah. And so, if you want to be who you say you are, you gotta you're gonna have to prove some people wrong. And so, and then basically it was like, you know, hey, you're a barb. You don't pitch very often as a young player. And you had to prove to Glenn, you know, Coach Chikini that hey, I'm the guy, and you became the guy. And then you came here, and I said, did you start on Friday nights your first week here? And I was in the bullpen. Okay, why? Because you had to prove to Robe that he could count on you. And when you did, now you're his guy. I said, Jerry's no different, man. You're going to have to go out there and you're going to have to prove it against the best players in the country. And if you think you're a big leaguer, then, you know, you're going to prove you're gonna have to prove it. And then so my wife's like kicking me in the leg and let's go get him and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'll go get him. I, and I told him, I said, man, if you want to come home, I'll come get you. I'll send you a plane ticket. We'll come home right now. And then so he was like, no, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay. And then so he stays. And then we get off the phone and she's like, all right, we're changing plans. We're going tomorrow. And so we're supposed to be there in another – we weren't supposed to leave for like three weeks. Uh -huh. And so, we, I mean, we changed flights. We changed hotel. We changed the whole deal just because she's worried about, you know. And so we went and flew and took care of it. You know, we kind of got up there and got all going. And then it was funny because there was two or three days in between before we went up there. And they started playing games. And after the first couple games, he called me. And it was a total change of emotion. It was pretty funny because the first night he calls and he's like wanting validation. And then the second time he called, he said, I'm about to tear this league up. I'm going to carve these guys up. I'm just telling you. After yeah. watching two games and the way they're approaching their at-bats, I'm going to carve these dudes up. And that's what he did. So, and Was there a point, Gunner, where you felt vindicated, where that Jerry came back to you, maybe uh, affirmed you? He came right before I left. Cause I was on the innings limit, um, and so him and uh, Jerry and Coach Robe were in contact, um, just kind of talking about how they were going to use me. Um, but there was, I want to say, for me personally, after I think I, I had a start or I had a um, an outing at Hyannis where I threw three innings. I think I struck out eight of the nine. I mean, I was that was probably the best I've ever thrown in my life um, for a three inning span. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that was the validation for me personally. Um, but then at, after after it was all over, after I threw my last outing, um, we had a uh, another meeting. It was basically just me and Jerry though, um, and we were just talking, talking about you know plan different plans, life, all kind of stuff. And and at the end, he just told me it was like he literally looked at me. He was like, I've been around baseball for X amount of years. Whatever it was, years. 55, 60 years. He was like, you're a big leaguer. He was like, you're one of the one of the most unique and coolest guys I've ever been around in my life. He's like, I just want you to know that. And I was just, you know, I've taken aback at first a little bit, um, but that was something, I mean, that's something I remember for the rest of my life. Yeah, especially after he came to you and told you, you, you might not even be good enough for the Cape. Yeah, now, yeah. He's, now he's making this kind of proclamation. Yeah, right. He was just saying, he was like, how you go about your business, how you do everything, how you hold yourself. He was like, you're a big leaguer, dude. He was like, don't, he said, don't stop because you think you're not. He was like, if you get in minor league bar, whatever happens, he was like, make them make you stop playing. So fast forward, a couple of big changes in the next year to come, right? Obviously, Tim makes a change. Let's get smart, comes down here. <laughs> and then you had to do probably one of the toughest things you've ever had to do. Set out the whole year. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that it was probably nice that the, you, you were both close and together again. Yeah. But – it was probably one of the most tenuous years for both of you, huh? Yeah. It was a, yeah, it's crazy how it just, it, I guess it all came together, you mm -hmm. know? Just the, 
the up and down and the heartbreak and all the, just the stuff with the draft and then figuring out that I have not only to get one surgery but two surgeries and then he gets the job and it's like just crazy kind of how God put it put it together yeah. you know um, I mean we were at least I was down here for a good month two months after the draft and through all the surgeries and stuff and then he gets the job and it's just it's just crazy how it all worked out yeah. you know? my wife's convinced the arm thing was like divine intervention because if his arm doesn't give him issues then we probably don't get the leg looked at again and ultimately there's going to be there's going to be a, a pathological fracture and no telling how that thing plays out once it happens and so um you know because he had to have the arm and then the leg thing came up again. He basically said, I'm not waiting anymore because they kept trying to put this thing off. And, mm -hmm. you know, not a lot of people understand exactly. But the best way to explain it is like a PVC, like, pipe. Yeah, a PVC pipe with a with a water balloon in it. The pipe's fine, but it's filled with this, this you know, fibrous fluid, yeah, tissue. It's fibrous like a... tissue. And so and then the tissue is eating through the good bone and it's getting thinner and thinner. And when we found it, it's two inches and it grows to four and then it stayed at seven, like in his leg, forever. Stayed at like six. Yeah, almost. Around just, six yeah. for, for, I mean, the last Years. time we looked at it in high school and we decided not to have surgery, I decided not to play football. And basically we were getting it checked every three months. That's right. I was getting an MRI on my leg and just to make sure that it wasn't doing anything and it stopped bothering me. And so they were like, as long as you're not having any symptoms, you're not having pain, just yep. go about your day. You know, and at what point it started to, it looked like it started to calcify and normally it ruptures and you know, you never know what's in there. Mm -hmm. And so we thought it was kind of going away. And then, you know, right towards the end by the draft, you know, there were some teams that called and basically said, Hey, what is the deal with this leg? We want to see updated MRIs. And so we got it updated MRI and it was, it was 12 inch and it was just so it's happened double. that. Yeah, it's basically double what it was. I mean, it was literally from his hip to his knee. It filled his whole. It yeah. filled his whole. I mean, family. even if that's the thing, if the arm's not the problem, and I guess the leg thing doesn't affect the draft. Because I mean, who who knows? Who Some knows, teams really? could have been like, uh -huh. no way, we're taking this risk. Yeah. So I don't. Even, who knows? Um, but if they don't, and the arm's not a problem, then I get drafted wherever I get drafted. I go, and I mean, it's literally it's as simple as me jumping for a ball. You know, a chopper over my head and landed on my left leg, and my femur like completely shattering. Well, you remember a couple of years ago in the Final Four, the kid from yes. Brazil jumped up and jumped took the up jumper, and it just where? Yeah, yep. I mean, he just lands and his leg and shattered. shattered. And basically, you know, now knowing now what we know now is basically blessing in disguise. Yeah. He had the same. He had the same thing in his lower leg that Gunner had in his femur. So you saw what it did to his lower leg. So you can imagine what the outcome would have been if it happened. You know, if you're in a small town, a ball somewhere, and it happens, I mean, there's no telling. You know what I mean? And so, well, that's, that's we, we really goal. believe that it was all supposed to work out this way. And you know, he had the elbow surgery uh, with Dr. Dugas and those guys. Waited three, four months, had the leg surgery, and it was basically we had to wait long enough for him to build a whole crutches. You know, uh, without that the elbow brace on. And so, you know, that's the thing is, you know. I mean, the throwing protocol was set back probably six months because of this time. leg surgery. Yeah. And so you're already, you know, when he was, should have been throwing and rehabbing, I mean, he's laying on the couch with, you know, a 15-millimeter rod running the length of his femur. So everything's just been behind. We're still behind. You know, no, I'm still it, behind. Yeah, we, we, we thought we'd, you know, kind of push through it and whatever. But, like, I think he's more alert and aware and hypersensitive now to kind of some of the, the things that go on and – He's doing a better job of listening to, you know, what his body's asking for. And um, it's been unfortunate that he can't do what we're all accustomed to him doing on mm -hmm. Friday nights, right? But, um, you know, this inflammation in his flexor tendon and all this stuff that's come up over time, man, it's just it's because we're so far behind. All this stuff should have happened in the rehab, rehab protocol, but we started so late with everything that he hadn't been able to be who he is, you know? Yeah, but, I mean, not only – I mean, the rehab was late and – throughout rehab had ups and downs yeah. had shoulder stuff and had shoulder stuff was probably because of how far behind I was so I had to take yeah. you know five six or five six weeks off and gave my shoulder a chance try to get in a little better shape and it was almost there was never really a point where I could just it was almost like we just kept trying to patch like stuff would come up and we were just well what's the what's a quick fix or what's a quick fix instead of just just because the timetable I never really had a chance to really 
Start. I guess get it right. You know, yeah. like really just start from ground zero and get my whole body right. It was just a matter of, well, how can we make this feel better? Well, we just let's just do this so we can be ready for this. And I, I mean, that I was the ringleader of all that because I just wanted to be back. Yeah. Um, and now really leading into Texas, probably there was only about a, f which sounds like a lot, but when you, when you, when you really know it's not. But I mean. Texas was the fifth week of consecutive throwing that he had had since rehab. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that includes everything building up in there. Um, and so there was, I mean, there was, a, you know, and he told me after the game, you know, I, I think I'm about 60%, you know, and I, but I think it was important to him, you know, to come back and start on that Friday night. And, but that, you know, at the end of the day, he feels, and he, you know, he's talked to Robe about this and all that, but it's kind of why they are where they are now. But, you know, you're used to going out there and throwing six or seven every Friday. And then it's like he told Robe, it's, you know, I'm not entitled to Friday night and mm -hmm. I'm not performing like a Friday night guy. And it does me no good to go out there and throw three innings and hit this pitch count or this wall because I can't put, I don't have the physical stamina to go past it. Mm -hmm. And then we burn up our whole bullpen and then we ruin the risk of the losing the weekend series because selfishly I want to throw on Friday nights. And so... He had to kind of take a step back and look at it in big picture, big picture, not only for him, but, you know, for Coach Robe and, and the team. I mean, what are we really doing? You know, just to run out there on Friday nights just because is not. I just felt like I felt like I was killing us almost. You know, I mean, and it's not even that I, I wasn't giving up a ton of runs or anything, but three, four innings, five innings max, you know, absolute max five innings is just. On a Friday night, that's tough to, and then you got to line up. Especially, I mean, we're young in the pen. We got some young guys. We had some guys as far as their roles were kind of floating around. They were still kind of trying to figure it out, getting the groove of things. And so you, I mean, it just makes it tough. It makes it tough on road. It makes it tough on the players. It should, it wasn't fair to anybody, you know. So in all of this, um, in the last year, how important was it that you were there for each other? Because in the past, you weren't there for each other yeah. necessarily. I think in the time for, for everybody was probably good. You know, it's uh, it's great to be home. You know, there's just so many people that you grew up with and the, the community is really good. And then I think kind of the validation for me, um, you know, because I had a good job. I had a great, you know, I worked for a great head coach and uh, I didn't really know Coach Napier. Uh, we had had one conversation on our entire life about a recruit uh, one time. Um, and that was really it. So you don't really know, you know, what you're getting into with him. I knew this place was special, you know, uh, having experienced it with him and then watching what had happened over the years. And I always thought this place was the the place that could really turn into, you know, what Central Florida's done and what Boise's done mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, really be a force. And so to have the opportunity to come back was really, was really good. But kind of the validation for me is – you know, one of the first couple of days I was here, you know, I'm in my office trying to set everything up and you're scrambling and you're moving around. And uh, he had early morning training. Um, and, you know, I'm sitting there under my desk trying to wire everything up. And he just walked in and was like, hey, man, what's up? And then, you know, for the first time ever, really, you know, you're in the same room um, at work getting ready to go through the day and it, it, that's been really cool and then a lot of times for practice i'll leave and cut through the weight room and he's in there and i get to talk to him a little bit there and so it's it's really been really good and so you know he comes over a bunch he and his girlfriend um we have dinner you know once once a week probably hang out somewhere at some point and then you know we're at every game now you know that that we can so uh, it's been good so i think it's been good for everybody so yeah it's been been good <laughs> now it seems just like i don't know it's like life now you know yeah, it's, it's not just like part of the routine been now. for a little while but i mean I'll go, <coughs> I'll go eat lunch with them i'll grab you know we get fed now um so i'll go grab my lunch out of my locker go into his office and eat um go yeah ahead. that's been the coolest thing like every day pretty much you know he comes in and this the nutrition plan that dr maggard and everybody's implemented all these athletes get their you know pre and post practice food um, and so every day, I mean, literally two, three, four times oh, a week, yeah. depending on when the travel, what the travel schedule is, he mm -hmm. literally grabs his food and comes sits in my office. And it always times out where that's kind of our break in our day for us. And they gives us like an hour in the day where, you know, you eat, you work out, you do whatever. And mm -hmm. so we kind of just, we hang out, kind of talk about a little bit of everything really. 
What? Like buying and building houses, pets, <laughs> you name it. Well, and that's something you couldn't even do when, when Gunner was in high school and you were at Lake Charles. Yeah, really. Lake Charles. Yeah, really, really. No, yeah. it, was, it was hard to do. It was hard to do. So, Especially when recruiting guys started and all yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, April just... and May. And, and then, you know, uh, um, there were some high school games. Obviously, we're traveling. You know, and he's playing on Friday night. I didn't get to see the football games either. So, you know, you end up spending a lot, of, a majority of your time away from everything. And I think, you know, one of the things for me that that kind of changed is, you know, for early part, I was so caught up in like trying to be really good at what I was doing and trying to create the best situation for the kids I was coaching and all that. And, you know, there were days where, I mean, there were a lot of days now from the time he was born until he was about nine years old, ten years old, where I would leave before he woke up, and when I got home, he was asleep. And so, um, you know, to have the opportunity to kind of make up some of that time has been really cool, you know. So, yeah. Mom's happy. Yeah, Mom's happy. So, She's which is part of the, you know, their relationship. They're really close. And part of it is because I was really, you know, I was in the grind and kind Doing of lost job. track of really what, you know, what really is important. And so I think the really cool thing about Nape is, you know, um, Obviously, he's a father, too, and, and he kind of appreciates and understands the time. And so, like, today, I was like, hey, I'm not sure what this is, but, you know, I'm going to have to leave staff meeting and go do this thing. And he's like, D you and Gunner need to go do that. Go do that. You know, he's adamant about it. And Coach V was the same way, but, um, you know, to, to actually be in the same spot, to be able yeah, to do it is, is about the, is the coolest thing, you know. Three hours so, away. Yeah, the, hard, the hardest part was before, man, is just, you know, you had to man maneuver your schedule, but then – if it wasn't that way, you drive in three hours, you watch them throw on Friday nights. A lot of times when the game was over, we'd go to dinner and then we'd drive back and we're getting back at one in the morning with Saturday morning practice the next day or whatever. I mean, it's just, it was hard, man. So this has been, this has been refreshing. It's been good, you know? So, and then to get to do it with, you know, just high school teammate. I'm just seeing so many people every time I go to the yard and, and hang out. It's been, it's been really good. So. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining me. Appreciate yeah, it, man. Thank Thanks for having us. And, um, you know, I don't know. Just thank you to everybody that's made our experience here, you know, what it is. So Yeah, for sure. Place is special. I think everybody knows that that's listening to this. So. Good. Yeah. Okay. I could have made it two more minutes, man. I didn't realize.